Bill Hillary Clinton. Good morning, everybody. Hope you're well at home. I'm Bill Hemmer, live inside of America's News. So how are you? Good morning. Thursday morning it, Thursday is. it is. Good to see you. All right. All right. I'm Sandra Smith. The president also apparently backtracking on his willingness to sit down for an interview with Robert Mueller. And then turning the tables, saying the special counsel should be focusing on the Democrats instead of the GOP. There is collusion, but it's really with the Democrats and the Russians far more than it is with the Republicans and the Russians. So the witch hunt continues. Chief White House correspondent John Roberts joins me now. John, good morning. Sandra, good morning to you. The president did appear to move the goalposts yesterday in terms of whether or not he would sit down with the special counsel Robert Mueller or his investigators for an investigation in what the president's legal team fully believes is the final weeks of this investigation. After saying in June of 2016 that he would 100 percent sit down with Mueller and then when asked about it over the weekend at Camp David said yeah in response to the same question, the president seemed to walk all of that back after I asked him if he would sit down with Mueller or if he would do it with no conditions or if he would demand that there be a strict set of parameters around any encounter between him and Mueller. Listen to what the president said. But it has been determined that there is no collusion and by virtually everybody. So we'll see what happens. But again, would, you, would you be open to it? We'll see what happens. I mean, certainly I'll see what happens. But uh, when they have no collusion and nobody's found any collusion at any level, uh, it seems unlikely that you'd even have an interview. So the president suggesting there that an interview may be unnecessary. The president also very specifically pointed out how the FBI under James Comey appeared to fall all over itself to accommodate an interview with Hillary Clinton over her email scandal. Listen here. When you talk about interviews, uh, Hillary Clinton had an interview where she wasn't sworn in. She wasn't given the oath. They didn't take notes. They didn't record. And it was done on the 4th of July weekend. Uh, that's perhaps ridiculous. And a lot of people looked upon that as being uh, a very serious breach. And it really was. After the president said yesterday that there might not be a reason to have an interview, I checked with sources familiar with the investigation. They told me, Sandra, they do believe that sometime in the next few weeks, there will be some sort of an interview with Robert Mueller and that arrangements are being made for just such an occasion. Sandra? All right, we'll keep watching that. Meanwhile, there's been a lot of ambiguity on whether a wall will be part of a DACA agreement, John. And the president's clearing that up? Uh, yeah, he was pretty definite about that yesterday. You know, when he had that meeting with the 22 members of Congress on Tuesday, the president at one point said, my position on DACA and border security will be whatever they come up with, which uh, led to a sort of a massive freakout on the conservative side of things, fearing that the president might give up funding for a border wall to get a DACA agreement. Well, yesterday he was asked if Congress came up with an agreement on DACA that did not include agreement to pay for a border wall, would he accept that? Watch what he said. No. 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 It's got to include the wall. We need the wall for security. We need the wall for safety. We need the wall for stopping the drugs from pouring in. Uh, I would imagine that the people in the room, both Democrat and Republican, uh, I really believe they're going to come up with a solution to the DACA problem, which has been going on for a long time, and maybe beyond that immigration as a whole. But any solution has to include the wall, because without the wall, it all doesn't work. So let's take a look at the lay of the land. You've got conservatives on one side worried that the president is going to give away too much to get a deal. You've got Democrats on the other hand, particularly progressives, worried that the Democrats are going to give away too much to get a deal. Sandra, neither side is particularly happy, which usually means you're heading in the right direction. Really interesting. Kevin McCarthy coming up the next hour. We ask him a lot about this as well. John Roberts, thank you. Thank you. Meanwhile, another big story today, the House is getting ready to vote on the renewal of the FISA Act, a proposed amendment with growing bipartisan support would limit the authority of intelligence agents to collect foreign communications involving Americans. But we do not know if that amendment will pass. Have a listen. Our amendment stands for the simple proposition that when you want to spy on Americans, get a warrant. Uh, the bill as stands is completely unacceptable. We believe there are millions of pieces of information on Americans in that database. That should not be looked at without a warrant, but even with a warrant should not be used for domestic crime. Well, that man you heard from is Senator Republican Rand Paul of Kentucky. 
How you doing, sir? And welcome back here. I understand you spoke to the president last hour to talk about this. I did, and I think he's concerned that we need more oversight of the intelligence communities like we are. It's one thing to spy on foreigners in foreign lands, and that's what the FISA Act is supposed to do. We actually will reauthorize it. That's part of our reform. We reauthorize spying on foreigners in foreign lands. But millions of Americans are accidentally or incidentally collected in this database, and we don't want people willy-nilly just looking into this database without a warrant. Because, see, there's evidence now that some people in the FBI had a bias against the president and tried to get him defeated while at work or discussing among each other how to have an insurance policy. We had people at the Justice Department who worked with or whose spouse was with the opposition research group hired by the Clintons. So you can see how men are not angels, as Madison said. So what we have to do is make sure that somebody's watching and that there are checks and balances. The essential check and balance in our country for looking at someone's stuff, invading someone's house to gather their information, is a judicial warrant. This is supposed to separate the police from the, from the judicial aspect of this to protect people from bias. Okay. You, you've been on this issue for, for years. Are you ready to filibuster yet again? <laughs> you know, I don't know if I have 13 hours in me. I've been through a lot in the last couple of months. But I will tell you this, that the Bill of Rights is something worth filibustering over and that the idea that we should have a judicial warrant before searching an American's records absolutely is worth filibustering for. We have bipartisan support for this. This vote will be interesting to watch this morning because we think we have the votes. All night long, Republican and Democratic leadership have been twisting arms and trying to bribe people to change their votes. Because we think we're going to beat them this morning. Wow. The other you, thing you, you have to you, watch you is... You think this amendment will pass? I think it's going to be very, very close. We'll see what happens. Also watch them because they need to be held accountable if they pull the vote at the last minute because they're going to lose. Okay, we'll, we'll because watch they need all to that. Let, Let's see what happens over time. But just take me back to the White House, the conversation with the president. What, what, what does he specifically support on this? Well, you know, the administration has voiced support for reauthorization, but I think that the president indicated to me that he believes that any reauthorization should have significant reforms, meaning that you should have to have a warrant to look at Americans' records. You have to realize that all of us are caught up in this. If I talk to an ambassador or I talk to anybody outside the country, somehow I'm in the database. The president's in the database. Michael Flynn's in the database. Anybody, any journalist who sends an email to someone overseas and mentions the name of a terrorist, let's say you're writing a story about a terrorist, because you've mentioned a terrorist, now you and your counterpart overseas, who may be another reporter, are now caught up in the database. There are so many millions of Americans in the database, we should not not be searching Americans if you're not involved with terrorism or not connected to a terror target. We shouldn't allow okay. willy-nilly anybody to look at all this information. The reason I specifically asked about the president, because here's the tweet from earlier today on FISA. Here's where it came out about 7 o'clock this morning. House votes on controversial FISA Act today. This is the act that may have been used with the help of the discredited and phony dossier to so badly surveil and abuse the Trump campaign by the previous administration and others, he asked with a question mark. That tweet came out about 12 hours after after this statement came from the White House late last night. The administration urges the House to reject this amendment and preserve the useful role FISA Section 702 authority plays in protecting American lives. That in itself seems like it's a contradiction. Can you clear yeah. it up? I think that you can be for reauthorization and all for, for reauthorization with reform. And so I think, uh, you know, the president speaks for himself, but I do believe that the president supports reform and does not believe that we should allow anybody to look through this database without a warrant. We've seen how much bias there is. We've seen top-ranking people, the FBI, top-ranking people, the Justice Department, whose political bias has gotten the better of them. They brought their political bias to work, and then they have this enormous power. Realize that we have the ability to, to listen to every phone call in Italy for an entire month. There was a report from a year or two ago where we soaked up every phone call in Italy for an entire month. This is an enormous power, and we have to be watching the watchers. We have to have congressional oversight, and we need to have judicial judicial oversight because there is a great deal of abuse that's possible in this system and I think we have a real good chance of winning this today. Well, you you, you filibustered twice, right? 2015, <laughs> 2013. I got a total of 23 hours and 30 minutes. That sound right to <laughs> that's on about your clock? Right. Did you change right. you change anything? Um, wear comfortable shoes, uh, don't drink too much water. Uh, yeah, there's some Did things you change you have to anything? 
W did I change anything? Yeah, I think so. I mean, when I filibustered the first time, it was about whether or not drones could be used against Americans on American soil, and I finally got President Obama and Eric Holder to admit that they wouldn't do it. But the scary thing was that they wouldn't admit this when I first asked them. It took 13 hours of standing on the floor to get them to sort of acknowledge they wouldn't do something atrocious, which is use a weaponized drone on American soil. Yeah. Immigration, quickly, is there a deal to be made here or not? I think so, and I think wow. what you're finding, I think what you're finding is, is that uh, conservatives will compromise on this if we get border security. But that's a big if, and really, I believe immigration reform has died in the past because Democrats are unwilling to compromise. Democrats have said we want everything or we'll get nothing. DACA is something that now a lot of people are okay with trying to figure out a reform on, but it has to involve border security. It has to involve getting rid of the diversity lottery. It has to involve getting rid of chain migration. Thank you. Sir, come on back. All right, Rand Paul will watch the vote in the House and then we'll come back to you and see what your next move is. Thank All you, right. sir, very much from the Hill. Also, there are 32 Republicans retiring from the House, there are three Republican senators retiring from the Senate. This balance of power issue is going to be coming in the forefront come spring, so we'll get into that a bit later here. How are you doing? Yeah, that's catching right. a lot of people's attention. I'm sure yeah. we'll be asking a few people over the next couple hours about that, don't you think? All right. Well, it is a very, uh, very big news morning here on America's Newsroom. Battle over immigration reform controversy over the unverified Trump dossier and that big FISA vote. On deck later this hour, former Trump campaign manager Corey Lewandowski joins us. As we wait on that, what do some states in Mexico share in common with war zones like Syria and Afghanistan? Let's say the new travel warning issued just to Americans coming up. And ICE cracking down on illegal immigrants. The message the agency is sending American businesses after ICE launches nationwide raids. This is all about removing a magnet that entices for the illegal entry. The employers need to be held accountable. They need to pay their taxes. There's a right and wrong way to hire workers, and they got to do it the right way. This is a Fox News alert. The State Department issuing its highest level of travel warnings south of the border. Five Mexican states now classified as, quote, level four risk in terms of potential danger, making them virtual no-go zones for American citizens. All five seen as hotspots for violent drug cartels and criminal gangs. To put this travel warning in perspective, this top tier is shared by many violence-plagued countries in the Middle East and North Africa, including Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq, Syria, and Yemen. 16 past President Trump touting a new poll on the economy. According to new numbers from Quinnipiac, 66% of you feel the economy right now is good or excellent. That poll says that the highest number since they started asking that question back in 2001 from the Fox Business Network, host of Making Money, <clears throat> is Maria Bartiromo. <clears throat> Mornings with Maria. I like to make money too, you know. Yeah, right? Yeah. I mean, you and Charles yeah. are like, you're making money every day all yeah, day. Yeah, exactly. Hey, <laughs> you see these numbers from Quinnipiac. Yeah. And it must, it must give folks a lot of sense that, you know, things have turned a corner. Yeah, for sure. Look, things have turned a corner. Please, Bill, we're talking about the opportunity for 4% economic growth in 2018. Right. The largest bank CEO, Jamie Dimon, told me this, this week alone that 4% is possible. Now we're talking about possibly four inc interest rate hikes by the Federal Reserve because things are getting better. And look at the minimum wage going up. Look at wages and all these bonus checks that companies are paying out. That's a direct result of the tax plan and anticipation mm. that things are getting Let better. Let me come back to that in yeah. a second. Here. Also in the poll, this is what they found about who gets the credit for it. In Quinnipiac, they find 49% say President Obama did it, and only 40% say President Trump. Your reaction uh, on that? I, I find this really crazy. I, I, I think that when somebody's ideology overtakes their brain, you have a problem. Um, because ideologies, I think, are dominating that poll. Look, there's no doubt that the, that the uh, expansion bottomed out under President Obama. There's no doubt. The, the, the stock market and the economic uh, recovery began under President Obama. No, no doubt about it. It was in 2009 was the bottom of the market and w when we first started to see a change in terms of economic growth. But we have been 
been growing in the last 10 years by on average 2% under President Obama. His best year was the worst year for most presidents. So once President Trump started campaigning on these policies about lowering taxes, about rolling back regulations, there was an anticipation that started to creep up, and that started to force businesses to unleash the purse strings. There's a reason that businesses were sitting on so much cash under the Obama administration, mm -hmm. and that is because they were getting strangled by regulation. President Trump comes in, he, roll back, he rolls back all of these regulations, and almost instantaneously, businesses said, okay, we are not going to be... You you know, uh, shackled anymore, and we're going to start looking for opportunities to put that money to work, whether it's hiring people or investing in their business. Watch so the, there's no doubt about that, it. Watch that number and see what happens with that over time. Uh, for Six sure. Six months from now, et cetera. That's right. Walmart had big news last hour. Yes. What's it doing? Big news. Walmart has announced that it is raising the minimum wage uh, to $11 an hour. It is also paying out $1,000 checks to hourly employees, and it is also changing maternity leave and parental care, giving people more uh, more opportunity to take off uh, for family reasons. And this is part of the tax plan impact. The CEO is out on Twitter with a post out basically saying, we want to pass on the savings. You've got hundreds of companies announcing plans to raise wages, uh, send out bonus checks, invest in their businesses, all as a result of the savings of the tax plan. You know, some of these CEOs basically don't want President Trump to think they're not on the team, the America team. And so they're announcing these things now. Others are saying, okay, let's pay out these bonuses now in 17 because we're not going to be able to deduct stuff in 18. But overall, everybody's looking at this tax workers. savings and yeah. saying, how am I going to share this? I think, I think when you, anytime you do big piece of legislation, maybe it's Obamacare from seven years ago, maybe it's the tax law right now, there are unintended consequences. And some of the unintended consequences are now starting to be, uh, to be shown bare. And, and this is one of them. Mm. And you've got more than 100 companies that are doing things that no one really expected. I mean, I, I watch a lot of Fox Business. Right. Nobody really predicted Nobody this. Nobody predicted this. That's absolutely right. And we're going to hear more. By the way, the rollback in regulation has already um, improved the, the uh, bottom lines for companies like media companies, telecom. You haven't seen the impact on the banks yet. All you've seen are new people running Great agencies, yeah. but you haven't seen that yet. So there's a long runway of this to continue. 18 is going to be a good year. I tell a lot of college kids, man, if you get an idea, pursue it, become a small business or a pass-through because you will save a a lot of money in the long run. Great if advice. You've got a good idea that can work. Yeah, so. it's a good, a good advice. Thank you. We'll Thank see you, you so tomorrow much. morning. <laughs> Thank you Thanks, so much. Maria. Here's Always good to see Maria. Well, a new investigation underway right now by the U.S. military after this video of a shooting in Afghanistan gets posted online. We are live at the Pentagon with the latest. Another alert now. Brand new video coming in out of the critical situation rather in California. A car getting washed down a road. These massive mudslides continue to threaten so many in California. We'll take you there live. It is a massive operation that we have underway. Still in the search and rescue mode as mentioned. But as we transition and will transition to a recovery mode, we realize that this is going to be a long and difficult journey for all of us. There is a search for survivors on now in Southern California. Deadly mudslides ravaging Santa Barbara County. At least 17 are dead. Dozens have been injured. Rescue crews doing all they can to dig through this massive amount of mud and wreckage. And those who managed to go unharmed are left to deal with the devastation behind. Check this out. Have a listen. My home is standing, but when the flash flood came, it couldn't pull the door shut. So it's just full, it's just full of mud and, and the backside, I guess, collapsed a little bit. I would say it's apocalyptic. I had no idea that the, that the devastation was like this. The U.S. Coast Guard now lending a hand using helicopters to rescue this man and his dog trapped on the roof of their home, rescuing eight people in total with five dogs in tow. And the conditions that caused that slide started with the massive wildfires from weeks ago. The, the fire burns the plant and the vegetation, which emits gas through the soil, weakening the roots. And once that gas cools, it solidifies. And that forms a wax-like layer in the soil, which allows large chunks of that slick topsoil to break loose. And if it's on a hill, like a lot of places in California, it just slides away. And then you get rocks and trees and the mud flowing downhill as fast as 35 miles an hour. Tons of debris causing damage like you saw in Santa Barbara County. And we will be on the scene there as the sun comes up for yet another day in a matter of moments.
The U.S. military is investigating a shooting in Afghanistan based on a video posted to the Internet showing what appears to be a U.S. service member firing his weapon into a civilian truck. Pentagon reporter Lucas Tomlinson joins me live now. Lucas, how serious is the Pentagon taking this allegation? Very seriously, Sandra. Defense Secretary Jim Mattis has been briefed, and the top American general in charge of all U.S. forces in the Middle East and Afghanistan issued this strongly worded statement, quote, I have reviewed the video, and I am disappointed and also concerned that the American people, our coalition partners, the Afghan government, and the Afghan people will believe that American service members are callous and indifferent to the horrors of war or the suffering of innocent people trapped in conflict. Now, what's missing in this video is context. It's unclear what prompted what appears to be a U.S. special operator firing into the window of a civilian truck in eastern Afghanistan, where roughly 1,000 ISIS-affiliated fighters are located. Officials tell me a non-lethal round might have been used. You can see the driver's window getting shot out, but no blood on the windshield. But General Votel went on to say this video does not represent the professionalism of the nearly 14,000 U.S. troops currently deployed to Afghanistan. Sandra? Lucas, it seems like the U.S. military is ramping up operations in Afghanistan. It is, Sandra. In the past year, three times more bombs were dropped in Afghanistan than the year before, and more U.S. jets are on the way. Now, the majority of those bombs being dropped in Afghanistan are being fired on that ISIS affiliate in eastern Afghanistan, and many of the 3,000 U.S. troops recently deployed will be moving closer to the front lines to help call in more airstrikes. And, Sandra, you can expect in the coming days more jets will be sent to Afghanistan. Sandra. Lucas Tomlinson at the Pentagon for us. Thank you. As we mentioned a moment ago with Senator Rand Paul, there's a big debate now unfolding on the floor of the House. At the moment, lawmakers debating the renewal of the FISA Act, Section 702, and there's an amendment right now that if it passes, got some Republican support, some Democratic support, it would more strictly limit the way intelligence officials collect communications that involve Americans. In other words, greater privacy restraints is what they're pushing for. But will this amendment pass? Rand Paul said he expects it to, but we, we really don't know. If it doesn't pass, Rand Paul's probably going to filibuster on the Senate side. So and a lot of this right now in the debate over the Trump dossier and whether or not Americans were unmasked going back to the election of a year ago. And the president tweeted about it just a few moments ago, a House voting on controversial FISA Act today. This is the act that may have been used with the help of the discredited and phony dossier to so badly surveil and abuse the Trump campaign by the previous administration and others with a question mark. So the debate's underway. The vote will happen, we believe, this morning, maybe in an hour or so. So we'll keep an eye on it, let you know whether or not that passes. So stand by. Plus, nearly 100 7-Eleven stores raided by ICE agents. Why this unprecedented sweep is serving as a warning to employers. Corey Lewandowski is here. We will get him to weigh in on all of this as Trump continues to crack down on immigration. Got to include the wall. We need the wall for security. We need the wall for safety. We need the wall for stopping the drugs from pouring in. So ICE agents storming nearly 100 7-Eleven stores nationwide. Unprecedented sweep for undocumented workers. 21 arrests made in all. Adam Housley live in LA tracking this story from Los Angeles. Adam, what happened? Yeah, one state where these raids took place, Bill, you know, the raids were a result of an operation that began back in 2013. So really about a five-year process before these raids took place. Been ongoing for some time as they raided nearly 100 7-Eleven stores across the United States. ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, says it's all about compliance, and it's just the beginning. They say Wednesday's raids are the largest single operation by ICE against employers under President Trump. They say it's not going to be limited also just to large companies or any particular industry, big, medium, or small. They're going to go after anybody who's not following the law. Of course, it's illegal for employers to knowingly hire unauthorized workers living in the United States illegally. 21 people were arrested on locations in California, Colorado, Delaware, New York, D.C., 13 other states as well. The sweeps are expected to be more common as many of these ongoing operations are now going to be acted upon, according to ICE. And agency leaders say this isn't just about illegal workers benefiting from themselves. It's also about protecting American jobs by eliminating unfair advantages for companies that are exploiting illegal immigration. If we don't address the causes of illegal immigration, if we don't give the men and women on the ground the tools to close these loopholes and, and to pass some legislation we need to enforce immigration law in the interior of the United States, you're going to have DACA again in 10 years. 
7-Eleven has responded in a statement. They say 7-Eleven takes compliance with immigration laws seriously and has terminated the franchise agreements of franchisees convicted of violating these laws. Again, that's from 7-Eleven. Bill, the big deal here is we've been working, of course, with ICE for a number of years here in Southern California. We've been out there on these types of raids. A lot of these operations go on for some time. So this isn't just a situation where you have a new president and you have new raids. What you have are a lot of operations that are now being acted upon. So you got to put the two together, and they say there's going to be a lot more. The whole idea, they say, is to ensure compliance specifically with employers who are breaking the law. Well, Adam, Bill. thank you. Adam, how's it there in Los Angeles reporting? Thank you, Adam. President Trump making it clear yesterday uh, that Democrats must agree to funding a border wall if they want him to go along with helping the thousands of dreamers that are here in the U.S., illegal immigrants, of course, brought here as children. Corey Lewandowski is the former campaign manager for President Trump. He's got a new book out, Let Trump Be Trump, the inside story of his rise to the presidency, and he joins me now. The president is a man you know well, Corey, and we've talked at length about this. And the president, as he wakes up this morning, he is tweeting about immigration. And he says, 45 year low in illegal immigration this year. We lead into you with that story. This appears to be the president's priority in the new year. Will there be a deal on DACA? Well, look, I think what the president wants to do is make sure we've got a wall on the southern border. We're going to end chain migration. We're going to end this lottery program. We're going to revamp the immigration system so the people that are coming here are the right ones, not just because we've got a family member or a relative coming. But the problem that we have is because of the arcane rules of the U.S. Senate, in order to get something done, you need 60 votes. And the problem with that is the Democrats have no interest in compromising on this issue. They're going to do everything they can to be obstacles like we've seen with the tax cuts that the president has pushed through. And so I don't know if we'll get the deal done, but I do know this. If we don't do something to secure our borders and the steps that we've seen just yesterday with enforcing immigration rules and making sure we are mandating e-verify by employers, then we're going to have a problem. This president campaigned on building a wall on the southern border. It has to get done. We have to find a way to make sure we're controlling our borders like every other sovereign nation does. So there's questions about how far congressional Republicans are willing to bend when it comes, comes to coming to an agreement with Democrats on an immigration deal here. Uh, but there's also questions about the president, because at that meeting the other day, Corey, he actually said, I, I'm, I'm going to be willing to sign anything that Congress puts on my desk at this point. But then he then he came back on that because there was a lot of speculation and questions about what exactly that meant uh, from the president. And here's what he said in response about the wall. It has to include the wall because without the wall, it all doesn't work. We need the wall. We have to have the wall for security purposes. Security is number one. And uh, so the answer is have to have the wall. So which is it? Is he going to sign whatever comes to his desk or is he going to is he adamant about the wall has to be funded? No, I, I believe the president is completely resolved in the fact that we have to get this wall funded and built and start building it immediately. We can no longer allow individuals to come into our country and kill Americans because we can't control our borders. It's very simple. The campaign uh, was about immigration. The president talked about it. He talked about the wall. He talked about the 2,000 miles of our southern border that need a wall. And now we're going to go and implement that because that is the pledge that he made. And unlike other politicians, when he makes a promise, he falls through. And Congress, the Republicans and Democrats, have to understand this is an issue the American people care about at an 80 percent level. They want to make sure our borders are secure and they need to now step up and join the president on this. The president also uh, making it very clear that he is not letting anything about this dossier going. He's tweeting about that this morning as well, disproven and paid for by Democrats. Uh, I just wonder from you, he's got a new nickname. Uh, for Diane Feinstein, and of course the big news yesterday was she released the transcript of that Fusion GPS congressional interview. Um, she, her Repo the Republican colleagues did not like that at all. Chuck Grassley was uh, adamantly opposed to what went down there. And the president had this to say, nicknaming her Sneaky Diane Feinstein, who has on numerous occasions stated that collusion between Trump, Russia has not been found, would release testimony in such an underhanded and possibly illegal way, totally without authorization, is a disgrace, must have tough primary, obviously hinting at what he thinks her motivations were. Corey? Well, I think what we've seen from Dianne Feinstein is that this is a political uh, issue in nature, and she's heavily redacted some of the language that 
Uh, she works with supposedly, or has been reported that she's worked with Fusion GPS to put out before it went out to be proactive. She's now blaming that she had a cold for maybe why she released this. I don't really understand how that's relevant. Why don't we, why don't but, we actually we listen to her saying just that? The one regret I have is that I should have spoken with Senator Grassley before. And uh, I've got, I don't make an excuse, but I've had a bad cold, and maybe that slowed down my uh, mental facilities a little bit. Had a bad cold, she said. <laughs> Look, here's the thing. Dianne Feinstein has been very public in saying that she has seen no collusion, no cooperation, no coordination between the Trump campaign and Russia. Nobody wants to say that. And what we do now know is that she should have worked with Senator Grassley to put this out together. But the bottom line is, what we know is this dossier was paid for by the Clinton campaign, unequivocally, by an attorney from the Clinton campaign who funded uh, this guy Steele in Great Britain, who was over in Russia trying to make up information and collect information. And there is a potential here that the FBI, the deep state, also had something to do with the funding of this dossier. And if that's the case, it's very concerning to a lot of people. I also want to ask you about this. Uh, the, 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 right now, the House is debating the renewal of the, this uh, FISA Section 702 surveillance program. It's happening on the House floor uh, right now. We uh, do expect that vote to come down. The president's tweeting about that this morning, saying, with that being said, I have personally directed the fix to the unmasking process since taking office. And today's vote is about foreign surveillance of foreign Foreign bad guys on foreign land. We need it. Get smart. The latest tweet from the president. Corey? Look, we do need our, our best surveillance capabilities on foreign officials living in foreign lands who want to come and do harm to us here. But I'm gravely concerned because we have seen, uh, it has been now outlined that Susan Rice and others were unmasking U.S. citizens, potentially campaign people, potentially Donald Trump, in an attempt to uh, look and see what they were doing on U.S. soil. That's the deep state. That's everything that's wrong with our government. And if our government is spying on U.S. citizens on domestic soil who are doing nothing wrong, there should be accountability, and those people should go to jail, in my opinion. All right, we will bring you the results of that vote when it comes in. Corey Lewandowski, it's always good to see you. Author of the book, Let Trump Be Trump, thanks for being here this morning. Thank you. You know, the flu is going around. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> A lot of folks in this building are a lot of folks under like the weather. Any, any, naming yeah. any names. But I we... think that we're still making good, <laughs> sound decisions, I believe. Uh, another big story we're watching today, the Trump team not letting down its guard when it comes to North Korea. The message the president sent me to deliver a year ago is the same that I will deliver when I arrive in Korea again and I visit Japan again, and that is that the era of strategic patience is over. And overnight, the U.S. deploying serious firepower to the Pacific only days after Pyongyang's talks with the South. Chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, Ed Royce, is on deck next. So this news from breaking overnight now, the U.S. deploying three nuclear-capable B-2 stealth bombers to fly to Guam. The move coming after those talks between the North and South. Uh, Republican Congressman Ed Royce, California Chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee with me on this. And, sir, good day to you. A lot to cover here. First on uh, the North Korea matter. You had the talks the other day, and the important point that many have stressed to us is once the Olympic Games are over, you need to keep the heat on North Korea. What do you think of the move of the B-2? Oh, I think you have to have a credible deterrence. Uh, and in addition to the credible deterrence, which we're exhibiting here, you have to have that sustained pressure that comes from sanctions and our diplomatic efforts. So we've got to keep up the pressure, and this is part of it. All right. Do you think North Korea listens to that? I think North Korea is only too happy to engage in talks, only too happy to stretch out the clock and at the same time to get concessions in exchange for promises that history shows North Korea has never kept. So we have to be very, very careful in terms of how we deal with North Korea. Uh, I am for increasing the sanctions and the pressure on them. Mm, at this okay. time and sending this credible deterrence. Right, we're going to keep a very close eye on this, certainly in the month of February and what happens after that. On Iran, it appears that the renewal of sanctions will continue, so it doesn't appear that there'll be much of a change in our nuclear policy. Um, is that the right decision? Well, look, uh, I oppose the uh, Iran nuclear deal. I don't like it one bit. But the toothpaste is out of the tube in the sense that the previous administration, the Obama administration, basically relinquished that $100 billion into the hands of the Iranian government. And as we see from the protesters, 
it ends up funding terror, right, and funding their missile program. What I want to see now is that we move forward with the bill I passed into the Senate uh, that will put that additional pressure, additional sanctions on Iran for its ballistic missile program, and also the bill that's in the Senate to put the pressure on Hezbollah. And we just passed a resolution this week going into the Senate on human rights abuses because of what was done to the protesters on the street, uh, to stand with the protesters and to put sanctions on those officials that were involved in those crimes against uh, those young mm. protesters. Well, wait, and we're, more word from the White House on all that. L your your sure future enough. is now up in the air. You will not run for re-election. How come? Bill, I've got one year left in this term as chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. As you know, we put in term limits for our chairman, and I'm at the end of that term. I now have an opportunity. I could go out and campaign, you know, 100% of the time, or I could focus on my work here on the, on the Foreign Affairs Committee and our national security issues and the measures we're trying to move through the House and the Senate. That's what I want to do. That's where I can have the most impact. Could, could That's you, what I need to do. Could you have won re-election, sir, in your district oh, I would in have won. I, I would win re-election. But as I say, I'm at the end of my term as chairman of this committee, and there is so much work to be done on the foreign affairs front, especially now with North Korea yeah, and I, Iran. I understand serious matters, yes. too. There are 31 Republican colleagues, 32 if you count yourself, who will not seek re-election. How difficult do you believe it will be next November to hold the majority? What I'm looking at is the strength of the economy, the reforms we're putting into place and that the administration has put into place in terms of uh, the economic growth that that's leading to, the tax measures and the impact we're seeing now in terms of the GDP growth in the country, the new jobs that are being created. From what I see, I think this economy is going to get stronger and stronger, and I think the result is going to be a good one for uh, House Republicans. I, I know the old adage about a, a president's party in power in midterms elections uh, often loses seats, but I see so much positive economic growth in the country, so many jobs being created, uh, I think the Republicans will do well. All right, sir, we House will speak elections. to you often over the next year. You've always been a good um, friend of the program here. So, sir, thank, thank you. you. Congratulations on your decision, and we'll speak to you real soon. Ed Royce, the thank Republican you. from California. Thank you. Internationally renowned singer Seal now calling out Oprah Winfrey for hypocrisy, saying she's been, quote, a part of the problem for decades. We'll tell you why next. Pop singer Seal calling out Oprah Oprah Winfrey for being a hypocrite, as it turns out, blasting her on social media days after her speech at the Golden Globes, saying she's been part of the problem for decades. Carly Shimkus, reporter over at Fox News Headlines 24-7, do explain what's going wow, on. Wow, yeah, Seal calling out Oprah Winfrey. So he posted a picture on Instagram that shows Oprah uh, with Harvey Weinstein at two separate events. One of the uh, pictures shows Oprah kissing Harvey Weinstein mm. on the cheek. Now, he posted that, and the text on that picture says, when you have uh, been part of the problem for decades, but suddenly they all think you are the solution suggesting she may have known about Harvey Weinstein's behavior and did nothing to stop it. And, of course, you know, it's just on Sunday. I, I just wonder well, what driving Well, Seal him. appeared on Oprah's show, and it was, you know, a very lovely appearance. She even, I believe, surprised him with a long-lost sister. So, no, I okay. mean. So, but to be fair, though, those are, those are pictures that have been circulating, as you very well know, that's right. all over the that's Internet. That's right. This isn't the first media. time we've seen this picture of of Oprah and Harvey Weinstein. Listen, every single major person in Hollywood knew Harvey Weinstein. A picture does not prove that you knew about what Harvey Weinstein was doing. Oprah is also a survivor of uh, sexual assault herself. So this is uh, something that is very near and dear to her heart. But there is some anger out there over how Hollywood is handling this because some actresses did know about Harvey Weinstein's behavior, like Jane Fonda. She said she knew and didn't want to say anything because it wasn't her story to tell. But now, uh, you know, people in Hollywood are trying to, you know, act like the champion of women when you could make the case that they kind of missed the boat. 
Uh, well, those pictures certainly aren't going to help because those are out there uh, in prevalence. Yes. Um, that being said, you're commenting on Hollywood as a whole and how they're reacting to this idea. As a whole, do you think Hollywood would be supportive of an Oprah run? I think that Hollywood would be extremely supportive of an Oprah run because many in Hollywood have already said Oprah 2020. Um, but you know what? Speaking of the presidential run, the higher you rise, more people are going to want to attack you. This is something that she could see as criticism on the campaign trail. Also on the